Welcome to MIT Supply Chain Frontiers from the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. Each episode features center researchers and staff or experts from the field for in-depth conversations about business, education, and beyond. Today, center researcher and instructor David Carell follows up with the MIT CTL Military Fellows about leadership and people management across cultures and across sectors. The views and opinions expressed in today's episode are those of the fellows only and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the United States military. Take it away, Dave. Thank you guys for coming back to another round of our podcast discussion. We had so many interesting insights come out of the last one. We thought as long as we have you here, we would take the time to talk with you again and get on tape, if you will, some of the many insights that have come out of that conversation, but also just, you know, our conversations in the classroom and and in the hallway around CTL. One of the things that came up in that conversation that we wanted to mine further was you talked about the idea of risk management on the fly. And I, and I wonder if, if you all could tell us a little bit about what your you know, military training experience has taught you about prioritization and risk management uh, in real time. So uh, Lieutenant Colonel Steve Lubert, hey, Dave, first of all, uh, on behalf of, uh, of all of us, uh, we, we appreciate being invited back. We all spent a lot of time uh, after the last podcast talking about uh, how much we appreciated the back and forth. Uh, and so uh, on behalf of uh, Colonel Young and Colonel Parker and myself, just we, we, we appreciate this second opportunity to kind of uh, addressing risk management from the Army's perspective. So we, we've got two different forms. Uh, one is kind of composite risk management, uh, and that really pertains to how we protect uh, soldiers and equipment uh, when c- we're conducting operations. Uh, but the second form of risk management that we look at that I think is most applicable, Dave, to what you're referring to is essentially risk to mission. That is, as we go about conducting our operations in the Army, uh, constantly assessing what is the risk to success? What is the risk that uh, will prevent us from achieving the objectives that we've established or set forth that we're going to do? And in terms of of risk management on the fly, I can only kind of give you some examples, uh, you know, where where I've I've done a form of risk management on the fly. And a lot of that's going to occur when we're overseas or when we're in the midst of operations uh, and we have something that requires a change of mission, uh, a new priority. The boss calls and says, "You know, hey, Colonel Lubert, I know I told you to do this, or I know, know I told you to go north, but now I need you to go south. Take a few minutes, assess your ability to go south and get back to me with, with what you need and whether or not that's feasible. And, and when I'm presented with that kind of uh, scenario, Dave, what I'm going to do is typically I'm going to red sell it. I'm going to identify some people within my team that have got the expertise or that may just be the most outspoken critic of going south, right, of doing something differently. And I'm going to ask them to, to critique the decision. I'm going to ask them to, to be the naysayer. And we're going to discuss what are those risks to going south? How are we best prepared to go north? And how are we not prepared now to go south? If I don't have a real uh, you know naysayer to play that role, what I'll usually do is turn to one of my intelligence officers, because the assumption is that they've got the best understanding of the weather, the terrain, the enemy's capabilities, all those things that are going to play against us in that change of mission. Uh, And I'll ask him to to kind of red sell my change of plans uh, so that we ensure that we're we're not in an environment where everyone's just saying, yes, boss, that's a great idea. I can't have, you know, a whole bunch of people that are going out of their way to agree with me because something will get missed. And so that's part of how we address that. And then ultimately, as they red sell my plan, as they critique uh, the the way we're going to change up our operations, what we're looking for is, okay, we've identified risks, whether it's the enemy or it's the weather, it's the terrain. Now, how, you know, you said it earlier, how do we mitigate that? And we look at that from a lot of different perspectives. Can I mitigate that with personnel? In other words, do I have a a really experienced person uh, who knows how to go south? Can I move him up to the lead vehicle? Do I have somebody that's got experience where we're going that wasn't important on this mission, but now suddenly is? Can I change my equipment around to mitigate risks? And one of the things that we often forget is, can I call my next higher headquarters or one of my subordinate units to my left or right or, or to the front or to the rear of me and ask them for enablers, you know, any, any kind of capability that will help to mitigate a risk? And so I can give you an example. You know, When we would change routes in Iraq or Syria, you know, what we were always concerned with was when was the last time that that particular route or road was inspected for explosives or IEDs or the types of things that you've all seen in the news. If it hadn't been inspected by teams that were very capable in doing those types of route clearance, 
I might ask, hey, before we go south, I'd like to get a route clearance team to go inspect that route. And that's how I'm going to mitigate risk by reaching outside of my organization uh, and bringing in another enabler. And it could be asking for a drone to do an overflight, so forth. So this is this is composite risk management, and and this is risk management, and a lot of it was done at the back of my vehicle. You know, literally, you know, doing a a, a short halt someplace safe, establishing security, uh, getting out a whiteboard or writing on the back of an MRE box. Hey, change of plans. Boss wants us to go south. Why isn't this a good idea? Why can't we do it? Hey, uh, Colonel Joe Parker, to build on what what Stephen was saying, you know, the, the concept of risk is something that is taught and ingrained uh, very early uh, in a military career, whether it's uh, as a non-commissioned officer, uh, corporal or an E5 or a second lieutenant, first lieutenant. In Garrison, like you said, we, we have the uh, composite risk management worksheet uh, and it's, it's, it's very deliberate. It is low, medium, high, extreme. Everybody throughout the Army, everybody throughout an organization grows up and knows, you know, what a prudent amount of risk is that they can take at echelon or, or, or in kind of their their space. And if you exceed that, it's not that we can't proceed with the mission. Someone above you or someone with more responsibility, more visibility, more resources has to assume that risk. And so we're not a risk averse organization. We, we are all about you know, accepting prudent risk because our, our, our job and our profession is inherently risky, uh, whether it's at home in a motor pool, fixing stuff, driving a tank, flying a helicopter, or, you know, deploying into a combat zone. But the right people who have the right resources and the right visibility have to be involved in the process so that the right decision is made. And where you see things go south is where a junior officer, junior NCO, junior leader sometimes takes on more risk than is appropriate or they should they aren't able to see kind of what's on the other side of you know the berm, so to speak, or what's going on on to their left or to their right. Uh, whereas that that higher headquarters or that adjacent headquarters has an has a additional information that they can help them out. And so, you know, it, it, it's extremely serious. You know, because we are talking about you know f- uh, you know risk to force, risk to mission. Uh, we're talking literally in some cases about people's lives and safety. And so it's something that's taught very early on at every school of, you know, focus in pretty much every environment that you're in, you know, in, in, in an organization that is, that is known for having to take risk. Um, it, it's one of the, the most important and, and, and the most consistently talked about uh, topics and what we do on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, this is Brian Young. All I had to add is that when we think about risk, we think about it in terms of, you know, probability and severity. And those, those things are often, uh, subjective assessments. And in order to get a good subjective assessment on those two aspects of risk management, you cannot do that in a vacuum. And a, and a leader should not and cannot, you know, effectively do that on his or her own. So, you know, good teams, somebody once told me that, um, you know, good bosses want to know your answer, bad bosses want to know their answers. And I think that good bosses in this context are the ones that, as Steve was saying, you know, reach out to the team and get a full assessment of what, uh, you know, a diverse set of opinions on this to be able to, to properly assess that. Thank you very much for that. And that really leads to a, to a follow-up. It, it was quite interesting the way you guys described, you know, red selling or use that term to describe a way of getting, you know, new information that maybe you didn't have. And, and I really liked how you said it, Brian, with the, you know, what good bosses really want is to hear from you. Could you guys maybe describe if I'm, if I'm someone you've asked to red sell something, well, first, could you could you explain a little bit about where the term comes from? But also, what does it mean to do a good job playing the red sell? And then also, there's got to be some tips towards doing a good job receiving the red sell and, and making something out of that information. So, Dave, it, I, I'll probably let Colonel Parker, Colonel Young uh, speak to, to the doctrinal history of it. You know, from when you're the the good guys, you're the blue force. Uh, every, everything that's your opponent, uh, we've kind of been raised to to see it in red, right? So, red team, red cell. Uh, you know, the enemy is the the red the red icons on the map. Uh, so, it's it's anything that really is going to oppose or challenge your plan. Um, and it's also contextual. So, if I if I just want to know, you know, how's the enemy going to respond to my plan um, in kind of a holistic way, then I'm I'm probably going to call on my intelligence officer because. He has spent uh, a lo- hours upon hours, most likely, uh, studying how that particular enemy formation fights. That's what his focus has been. 
And so if I ask him, how are they going to respond if I do this? He should have a pretty good understanding. He should be able to put himself in the position of that, that enemy commander uh, and, and red team or, or war game my plan. The other side of that is, you know, perhaps the challenge to my operation is artillery based or it's my ability to, to communicate with my forces. My staff wants to, to enable me to be successful. That means that they are going to be inclined to tell me uh, that we can do whatever you ask us to do, sir, because they, they want to. They want to be successful, and that's what determines success for them. It, it's probably going to be up to me to, to say, let me bring somebody in that might not think the same way. And so if it's a communication question, I'm, I may walk across the, the woods to find a, a subject matter expert on communication who hasn't been part of this discussion. If it's a question of whether or not my artillery can outmatch the enemies, I may go find uh, my artillery support officer and bring him into that discussion and ask them that I need you to take a look at this plan and tell me whether it's feasible. Tell me what risks I'm assuming. Tell me if this side of the tent is right in what they're telling me. And then somewhere in the middle, we're going to come to a consensus as to what the real risk is and, and what steps or what measures we need to take to mitigate it. So red teaming is actually defined as a structured iterative process executed by trained, educated, and practiced team members that provides commanders an independent capability to continuously challenge plans, operations, concepts, organizations, and capabilities in the context of the operational environment and from our partners and adversaries' perspective. Uh, The only reason I add that here is that red teaming or, or having a red cell it's not something that we just kind of thought up. I mean, it, it's it's a very deliberate, structured process in the context of what we do on a day-to-day basis. You know, I just need someone that can give me an honest look or an honest read uh, on what my plan looks like, what the pros and cons are, and, and give me a fair shake. And, and a good leader and a good organization can pull that in in context and, and adjust on the fly. Yeah, I think the, the key aspect of that last part of the definition and what Joe was saying was the, um, you know, bad red teams will mirror image uh, the organization that they're, that they're trying to provide a counterpoint to. So you have, you know, when you're in a red team or you're trying to red team a situation or maybe in the case of business, when you're trying to think about what your competitors are going to do or, or, uh, or move, you know, move to um, a bad red team will, will always uh, mirror image what's going on in the organization themselves instead of thinking it from the enemy's perspective. Gosh, thank you guys. And, and that really seems to me like something as academics we could learn from, you know, making space for those counterpoints the way that you described it. And, and I wonder, does it ever happen that the leader takes the criticism too personally or is that part of the training is you know not to take it that way? No, I, I think you just, we would all agree that you have to understand that that you're, they're doing specifically what you asked of them, that you need critical assessment. E- even if, if we consider ourselves brilliant leaders and brilliant tacticians and whatnot, uh, you're going to be tired. You're going to be fatigued. You're going to have all the emotional factors that a human being is expected to have when in those types of in, you know uh, environments and, and under those types of conditions, and you're going to make mistakes. I, I've gone as long as 36 hours without sleep and had to continue to make very informed decisions based on volumes of data. So if I don't have people that I trust to say, hey, sir, you're not looking at this the right way, then I'm, I'm going to make poor decisions. And those decisions can be I- incredibly costly. Uh, so I, I, I can't take it personally. And, and I have to depend on, on my staff and the people I invite into those decisions uh, to help me make responsible leadership decisions. And I think it goes back to some of the previous points, you know, the discussion of risk uh, and the processes that we do, all grounded in doctrine, all taught and retaught at every every major school, every major, you know, kind of leap uh, from a company grade officer uh, to a field grade officer to a senior leader. Uh, it, it's reinforced throughout our careers uh, because of those environmental considerations. You know, we train wartime like environment, uh, operational environments under all those uh, environmental conditions that, that Stephen alluded to. Uh, sleep deprivation under, you know, darkness, tactical scenarios, all that type of stuff. Uh, and so we have a deliberate risk assessment. We have a deliberate red team. We have a, a very specific doctrine uh, because we have to build those sets and reps. And then we have to train it in an environment as close to the real thing as possible so that when we do find ourselves in a situation where, you know, it's game time and everything's for real, you can fall back on the on that experience. And so 
you know, a good leader, especially, you know, we've all got, you know, 20 or so years, uh, 20 plus years in, in, in the military now. If at this point we're not taking advice, then we are in the wrong business. If you're not listening to your subordinates, if you're not listening to your staff and at least taking that under consideration, the problem might be internal. I think, I think Colin Powell said it best, you know, the, the second uh, your soldiers stop bringing you their problems, you've got a problem paraphrasing his quote there, but the, you know, the second you start hearing things that sound exactly like you and people start parroting uh, what it is you're saying, then you might need to look internally because you know, that you're not getting a fair shake. And the worst thing that can happen as a leader is, is just that, like, you've got to have the voice of dissent. You've got to have those different inputs. You've got to have that feedback to help make informed, educated decisions. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're off the rails pretty quick. I uh, thought about just now about Malcolm Gladwell's book where he talks, uh, Lieutenant General Van Riper, he's a Marine Corps, uh, rec- retired Marine Corps general. He talks about his experience with Millennium Challenge 2002 uh, and where he was running the red team for that exercise. Um, I, I won't retell the, the, the story, but uh, I think it's a good one to revisit to understand what learning organizations, uh, adaptive organizations, how they respond to good red teaming and, and uh, how inflexible organizations don't, don't respond well. So that discussion takes us to, to talk about something that maybe people who aren't familiar with military leadership wouldn't expect to be as much a part of the conversation as it has been in our internal conversations. And, and that's empathy for the people that you're leading. You know, I wonder if, if you all could share with us how how you build teams that are cohesive that that trust one another particularly in you know the very extreme situations that you're managing these folks you know like you said you want to hear from your subordinates what does it mean to really hear from them to take action based on what they share with you and what kind of things do they share with you that call on your ability to be an empathetic leader i'll take take this i think the best way to encapsulate it is to provide an example um and that is that uh on my last tour in 2021, uh, maybe one in seven to one in five of, of my soldiers had combat experience. So I actually had a lot of, of soldiers with no experience whatsoever actually being in combat. Very well trained, very well committed, just inexperienced. And within about a month or so of arriving at our position, we had an evening where we received a, a very significant enemy attack. Very loud, very violent. That kind of persisted throughout the evening. People were injured. A contractor was killed. Uh, buildings were damaged and caught fire. It was a bad night. For me, it was, well, this is Iraq. Uh, I had been there before. I had been through uh, similar experiences. It just kind of validated for me that I was back where I remember being at previous points in my career. It was scary. We fought through it. It was different for me because I was now in charge of a much larger organization. So I had I had greater responsibility. But it wasn't anything that I hadn't experienced before. And the next morning was ultimately another work day for me. I met my Sergeant Major. We discussed the events of last night. And then we did what we tend to do, which is battlefield circulation. And, and that's what we refer to driving around, walking around and visiting with your various units uh, throughout the battlefield. Uh, when we came to the unit that was closest to the events that had happened the previous night and that were involved in a lot of deterring that attack, I was shocked at how traumatized they were. It stood out to me because I didn't share in that same trauma because this wasn't the first time I'd experienced an event like that. So I walk in with a cup of coffee uh, and my sergeant major walks in and we're in a very different environment uh, than we were prepared for. And we were dealing with a lot of soldiers that had a lot of trauma. And you could tell we're shook up and they, they weren't telling jokes and they weren't ready to, to jump at the next mission and so forth. And we had to immediately acknowledge that to immediately you know ask ourselves, how do we reprioritize our day? to acknowledge that these soldiers have got needs that have to be met right now uh, in order for them to be able to continue to do what we need them to do for the next 10 months, 11 months, uh, for the next 24 hours. But, you know, as a commander, I, I, I had a pretty busy day on my schedule, so I needed to make a decision right then to acknowledge that, that those soldiers needed chaplains and unit ministry teams. They needed trauma specialists that we travel with. Uh, they needed to talk to their battle buddies that might be in another unit, but that's their best friend. And my Sergeant Major and I needed to to understand that everything else we had could probably take a step back or be pushed to the right so that we could focus on those soldiers. Because if we hadn't, I think we would have lost the ability to relate to those soldiers and for those soldiers to relate to us. Uh, We had built up a lot of trust and and a lot of respect with our, our soldiers, but 
I think if we had walked away from that, or if we had just said, hey, you know, brush it off and, and go get on your post, I think all of a sudden we would have lost that that ability for that soldier to believe that their boss and their sergeant major could relate to what they were going through. So instead, what we needed to do was address their needs, demonstrate to them that we went through all this. We went through these same types of experiences uh, when we were there earlier, and it was scary and it was shocking. But that, you know, we we took steps like we were going to take over the next 24 hours or so or the next several days if, if needed uh, to get those soldiers back where they needed to be. But that was certainly probably the biggest example I have of when I really acknowledged uh, that addressing those emotional needs and acknowledging what my soldiers required from me, you know, really stood out to me. First of all, thanks for sharing, Steve. That was an awesome example. I think the applicability to leaders and managers across both military and corporate organizations are, is just that trauma is much more prevalent than we, than we think it is, right? So for example, you know, one in five or one in six females are the victims of sexual assault during the course of their lifetime. One in 33 men are victims of the same sort of crime. We have many people in the military and also in our organizations in the corporate world that, you know, come from extreme poverty backgrounds or from, you know, some sort of other trauma, you name it, right? So it is out there. And the chances is when you're looking across your factory floor, you're looking across your formation in the military, that there is a, there is a high percentage of folks that have and are carrying with them traumatic experiences through their life. And if they haven't already, life will eventually catch up with us all and, and we'll have to face hardships, right, and work through them. Um, I think one of our jobs and responsibilities as leaders is to be informed and be effective in helping people you know, first of all, if they're in crisis to, to work through that with them in a, you know, in an empathetic way, but also understanding that a subordinate's first response or maybe their poor performance on a certain task maybe could be perhaps grounded in, in some sort of trauma response. So, you know, those soldiers, they're in Steve's formation, they get out of the military and they go do something else. And if that, that trauma is unresolved, or it could be a, a person in a civilian company that goes through some sort of civilian trauma, we don't have to have combat experience to be survivors of traumatic experiences that we can respond in an empathetic way in that moment. I, I think every manager should read The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel uh, Banner Kolk, you know, one of the leading experts in terms of understanding how early childhood trauma especially affects neuroanatomy as you grow older, right? So trauma is, is treatable, but um, we're going to face as managers a lot of uh, a lot of experiences with people that, that have that, that are unresolved. So, and, and I'm not advocating we be amateur psychologists as managers or, or leaders. That's not what I'm advocating, but I'm just saying that what we do need to, to know is, is that a certain response or an emotional response to a certain task or, uh, or an event could be uh, embedded in some sort of, you know, trauma response from, from something earlier. One of the lead questions I get, you know, how do I be a good manager or how to develop a style? And I think that the answer that I always fall back on is understanding yourself too, right? So if you're, if you as a leader, there's no shame. Um, and we've done, we, we've made a lot of good progress in the military on this. We've still got a ways to go, but I think we've come a long ways in terms of there not being shame to, Hey, it's okay to not be okay, but don't stay there. Right. Find, find help and, and uh, you know, find healing in that moment. So you can be a better leader to, to yourself and others. The military in general, uh, you know, is a cross section of society. Um, you know, we come from every walk of life, highly educated, poor, rich, you, you know, you name it. And, and with that diverse workforce, you know, you have to adapt your leadership style, whether it's to a brand new private, like Stephen was saying, that's going to combat for the first time, or someone that's dealing with trauma that might be triggered based on a scenario that we have to go through in a military training event. You know, my, my story, my little anecdote is a little bit different. Usually two to three times a year, uh, the Army has block leave periods. So usually in the summer uh, and around the holiday season, you know, we all take off for a week or two and get to relax a little bit. And so I was out, stationed out in California and I was visiting my in-laws and I got a call from my sergeant major. Hey, sir. And this is literally eight hours after I had signed out on leave. I just got to their house and I'm already receiving phone calls of, Hey, sir, we got a soldier who's in jail in, in you know, this town. We've got someone who's been in an accident here. We've got someone who's got another. And so immediately, I, you know, I'm in, I'm in react mode. I'm calling, you know, their first lines. I'm calling their, their company commanders. I'm calling their first sergeants. 
we're making contacts with wherever, uh, you know, we're trying to get as much information because every time there's an incident, we have to send up an incident report. We have to, you know, talk to our higher headquarters. And so my first probably two or three hours uh, at my in-laws house was me on the phone with sheriff's departments and my sergeant major and we're, you know, we're tag teaming it and we're trying to figure everything out. And uh, my mother-in-law goes, you know, what are you doing? you're not trained to do any of that. Like you don't, you're not a sociologist. You're not a, you know, you're not a criminal justice major. I was like, you know, me being me, I'm like, well, I, at this point I've got a minor in all of it because every soldier is a different story. Every soldier is a different background. Every scenario presents itself differently. And there is no singular perspective. There is no singular answer. Stephen hit the nail on the head. You've got to treat everybody, you know, according to how they are within that scenario. And, and Brian hit the nail on the head when it was, hey, as a leader, I have to understand when I am within, you know, my left and right limits of being able to address this situation appropriately, or I need to punch it up to someone who's better trained. Yeah, I think it comes back down to really basically just knowing your people, right? Taking the time and, and having the personal curiosity to know, uh, to know them, to learn about them, to ask about what, what motivates them, uh, what their pet peeves are, what they... Uh, to, to really have a, a strong feedback loop and to, you know, to listen more than you talk when you interact with, um, with your subordinates and peers. And, uh, and to really, I, I think that is probably the number one recipe for, you know, high functioning organizations, because out of those, out of that knowledge, you're going to, you're going to take uh, away from that, what you can do to apply to, to better lead that team. And there's a way, like, like Joe was saying, there is a learned art to it. Uh, there's a way to interact with people differently based on what motivates them while at the same time holding everyone to the same standard uh, and moving the organization forward, right? So we're not saying that one person has one standard and another person has another standard. No, there's one, there's one standard of excellence that we're all uh, aspiring to. Um, but because of people's backgrounds, because of people's, you know, we're, we are human beings and this is an inevitably a human endeavor that we're doing uh, that we have to, know people and know our teams in order to lead them appropriately. Gosh, th thank you very much for that, guys. And I think I can speak for a lot of our civilian listeners when I say that, you know, your, your discussion just now probably really opened up a lot of our minds to what is on the minds of military leaders as you all are making decisions and, and leading teams. You know, you know, I heard two themes from what you described. One, you know, the the training that you've received and the experiences that you've had have led you to take seriously listening to your critics and in fact, even inviting criticism. And the second one, you know, listening to your subordinate staff about things that they're concerned with even outside of, you know, the mission at hand. And so if, if, you know, if one of the points we take away is, all right, there's two listening goals. What do you do to make sure you do something with that information? What sort of steps or actions um, do you take or does your training suggest you take so that, you know, you spent all this valuable time listening, but now you've got to do something with the data that you gathered? How do you get there? So we wouldn't be the Army if we didn't have a process. We have a very, very deliberate process called the After Action Review, so AAR process. You know, Stephen, I'm sure, has had plenty of them. The AAR process, it's a very deliberate process where we take a look at um, we take a look at what was supposed to happen, why something happened. We then kind of dive into what worked, what didn't work. We talk about why, uh, and, and then we talk about what we, what we would do differently next time. And so in the form that we do this, we've got structured and unstructured, kind of like data. We've got structured and unstructured AAR. It could be as simple as what we would call a green book, which is where I've got my little green notebook that the Army issues. And I've taken notes after observing, uh, you know, a unit do something or an organization do something. And I grab a couple of folks and, and we would call it, hey, let's go for a walk in the desert. I think Jonathan Burns calls it, a, you know, go walk by the river. Where I just take some leaders and say, hey, you know, let's talk about what just happened. Tell me, you know, what, what were you thinking? And I usually let the person that I'm AARing informally kind of run me through their thought process. And then, we, you know, we take them kind of on this journey. Uh, and well, hey, did you think about this? Have you thought about that? And that, that's more of kind of a one-on-one -on -one leader to leader. Uh, on a more deliberate AAR, we'll bring in maps, graphs, charts, data, and actually show folks what they did versus what they thought they were doing. And you go in a room, you throw up a couple of slides. Uh, it's deliberate. So we'll usually have, you know, three or four main topics that we've identified that we want to talk about. And, and you kind of let folks talk. Uh, there's generally not rank uh, in, those in those discussions. Everyone's allowed to be very candid. 
it's important that you do it as close to, you know, the last action as, as possible because you want to have everything, you know, kind of fresh in your mind. Uh, and sometimes because it's, it's so quick, you know, folks are tired. They're still coming off the adrenaline high. Uh, tempers sometimes flare a little bit, but you get honest feedback. You know, we're there to orchestrate it and make sure that everything stays kind of deliberate. But the process is one of the most powerful things we do because, you know, th- there's, there's nothing that's off limits. It provides everyone in the room the opportunity to say, hey, sir, you know, sir, you know, we addressed this back in the planning process, but we decided back then to do this. And here was a direct result of that. And that's the type of discussions, very candid, you know, and, and it takes mature folks at, at every level to take that feedback. You know, we thick skins, nothing's personal. It's for the good of the organization. How do we move things forward? Love the AAR process. It's continuous, it's deliberate, and it's how good organizations get better or, or, or get to great uh, because you accept that honest feedback about your performance and what you've done. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two things that make the United States Army the preeminent land force is the AAR process, the after-action review process, and the non-commissioned officer corps. So the sergeants, the command sergeant majors, the backbone of the Army that, that makes things run. And the AAR process is, is such a crucial pillar of that uh, for all the reasons that Joe laid out, that we are able as an organization, as a hierarchical organization, to hopefully get into a room after an operation or after we practice and rehearse things, which again, going back to the beginning of this podcast, rehearsals are one way that we buy down risk. But going you know, after those rehearsals, after the, the practicing of those operations, that we can come into a room and in a way kind of shed rank for a bit and speak to each other honestly as teammates and come out of there after we've set our piece uh, and be a better organization for it. The biggest takeaway from from this after action review process, and Dave, it kind of gets back to, you know, how do we translate all this in, into process improvement or into action? Is AARs end with uh, essentially approves or sustains a three, and and because everybody tends to think and remember in threes, I I can always recall that it was you know three improves and and three sustains. A, a good observer controller like uh, Colonel Parker or Colonel Young will ask everyone for that input. They'll, they'll want the lowest ranking individual to, to tell us something that we need to improve upon. They'll want me perhaps as the highest ranking individual to tell them something that I really want to sustain. And they'll capture that data for me, uh, or I'll have a note taker that's capturing those improves and sustains. And in the end, you know, what you end up with is those sustains are actions or policies or processes or techniques that we want to codify into something like an, a standard operating procedure, an SOP. We want to codify it in a manual. We want to capture it as uh, a, a way of doing business that we want to continue. Uh, and then we'll refine that process. You know, those improves, I, I'm not doing my job and I'm not making the best of that AAR process if I don't look at every single one of those improves and identify who is the action officer or NCO that's going to be responsible for that improve. What references do we want them to refer to when addressing that improvement? What do they need in terms of resources to address that improvement? And what are we looking at in terms of a timeline for addressing that improvement? Is it something where, hey, before you eat tomorrow night, I want feedback on my desk as to how we're going to make that improvement? Uh, Or is it something that, uh, hey, three months down the line, we've got another opportunity to do an exercise of this scope, and I want to see this improvement demonstrated successfully the next time we go and exercise? So I'm going to provide that guidance as to the, the resources, the action officer, the team uh, that I'm going to assign to that particular improvement. And then really it, it holds me responsible for making sure that there's touch points along the way to see that that improvement's not just being captured on a whiteboard or in somebody's notebook. And then it's never looked at again uh, when we walk away from that AAR process, but that it actually, you know, the, those sustains are captured as SOPs and those improvements are captured with a way forward to ensure that we do in fact improve uh, because what we don't want is six months down the line we're in combat and something that should have been approved on that was identified by somebody like a colonel young or a colonel parker never got fixed and now it costs somebody their life i I felt like we talked a lot about very military things but i'm wondering what you took away from it that translates out into the business world or into corporate life uh what resonates and how that you know how does that uh but, you know, what kind of stood out to you and, and what maybe we didn't translate well or doesn't translate at all? Let me let me jump in because something happened globally to humans and we went through a pandemic together. So now 
every mother, every child, every father, every brother has an experience of trauma and loneliness and fear and uncertainty in their lives. And so I felt like the kind of teaching that you have from the military could be useful to all of us because it's, it's not psychology. It's based on psychology. It's based on the, the touchy feely wokeness, but you're, re you're really using it in actual situations. And I, I felt like there's some aha moment that people could have there with like, oh yeah, I've been through trauma. To, just, just to give you the example. So when, when my, when my wife catches me becoming unresponsive or, or not watching the movie or so forth, and she says, you know, where are you at? Um, my go-to is I, I go back and I reassess every tactical situation that I was in where someone got lost or, or injured. Uh, and I reassess, I, I live through that moment. And, and I mean, it's, it's not, I'm sure people would call it traumatic, but at this point it's, it's a constant learning process. And so, uh, you know, I, I put myself back into all of those factors that, that I was aware of at that particular moment. Where was the enemy? Where, where was I? Where were my, my soldiers? What was the status of this, that, and the other? And what could I have done differently that may have, may have prevented somebody from being lost or being injured? And that's that, that that's an AAR process that goes on inside my brain, all right, probably for the rest of my life. Um, and I think that that speaks to exactly what you were just saying is, is th that is uh, the nature of this particular business. So I, I think we have to take it very seriously. And I think that's also why the army invested, because when I came home, obviously I had issues uh, when I came home the first time, um, but the army invested in retaining me and uh, recalibrating me and, and addressing those concerns because what they don't want is they don't want to lose that experience um, and they don't want to lose somebody that that does think about at night, how can I do it better the next time? And just have that person leave the military because they've classified them as having some form of trauma and that they're not good to the military anymore. And instead, the military said, no, Steve, you know, we, you just you just survived a year over in Iraq and, and we want we want you to stay in and we want you to be recalibrated. And, and we need all that experience for the next 20 years because we don't know how long we're in this for. Uh, and I'm glad they made that decision. and I'm glad people supported me to go and get help uh, so I could, you know, one day have ended up uh, at MIT and be a lieutenant colonel uh, because uh, I, I probably could have gotten out if people hadn't said um, stay in and, and, and continue to contribute and we'll make you healthy. I, I think that's. That's the uh, the power, Steve, in being a trauma-informed leader is what you're doing there is you're being vulnerable in those moments to your team uh, because when you are vulnerable as a leader, you set an environment where it is hey, that you are not a um, invulnerable Superman or an invulnerable person or even a cold person that doesn't want to talk about emotions, that you set the example and set an environment for the rest of the, uh, rest of the formation that it's okay uh, to have feelings and to, um, and to face them and, and to talk about them, right? Because we're, you're going to get better and stronger as a unit. Um, you know, this is not about, you're, you're saying the message this is not about me. This is about you and us. And, um, right. Yep, absolutely. But I do think it's interesting with everything going on in the workforce right now, you know, folks switching jobs so rapidly, the, the guy from, I can't remember what the company was, where he fired all of his folks over the Zoom call, whether it's uninformed, uneducated, you know, leaders who are all very smart because they wouldn't be in the positions they were uh, or, or successful in, in some way, shape or form. It, it's the we, not me. And, and that's, a, that's a completely different mindset than, honestly, even the army I came in, you know, 20 years ago we have the force we have. We have congressionally mandated in strength. We, you know, it takes a long time to recruit talent. It's, it's even harder nowadays to retain talent. And there's a lot of things out there for folks to do. And if, you know, folks aren't being taken care of, that's, that's not just an army thing. They're going to find something else to do. And, and so we can't screw it up as leaders. Dave, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on any of this, not necessarily that one, but whatever. <laughs> Gosh, as you've been saying, so so many things. Um, the one that's jumping out at me the most, and, and I don't know if this is the most helpful one, but is that, so like when you were talking about um, taking the criticism from the red team and delivering the criticism from the red team, I was thinking that requires an inner strength to not take things personally. You know, and you sort of describe that the the leadership observes who can do that and who can't. 
And then the same thing I was thinking, Brian, when you were um, uh, commenting on when Stephen was sharing the, the personal story, I was also struck by the way you, you shared it, Stephen, and that like a lot of people can't describe their own personal emotional experiences without getting emotional. And so then I was thinking, all right, well, how did, how did he get there? And I thought you kind of nailed it, Brian. He said he wasn't sharing it like in a self-serving way. It was a, this is something that I'm bringing out and it serves this broader goal. So I guess that's, what's really struck me is how, if, if those of us who don't have the experience and the training that you guys have want to be able to do the things that you're doing, how do we get into that sort of stronger and more selfless mindset that allows us to take criticism and give criticism impersonally and also share emotions um and impersonally isn't the right word but i don't know if you see, if what i'm getting at is coming across to be able to do it in a way that's towards a bigger goal and not emotionally charged so that i've been really impressed by you guys with that how do you teach that yeah it's almost an inverse logic that I would imagine in corporate environments, and it happens in the military too, where you want to be successful personally, but at the same time, the way to make the best way to make that happen is to make your team successful because, and those around you successful and forget about your own ego and forget about, you know, yourself or your progression or the next job or whatever it is, it, you know, those things will come as long as you focus on the here and now and focus on making those around you successful and most importantly, the team, you know, um, functioning and high performing. And that's, that's really hard for people to let go of it. I mean, it's hard. It's been hard for me in some instances, right? Like I'm not perfect in this in any way, fashion or form, but um, on the teams that I've been on or led that have, that have produced have, have been those ones where we are focusing together uh, on the way forward, not just on individuals, uh, best performances in there. Oh, and that, that paradox that I really like the way you said, if we could just even point it out that, Hey, that's a paradox. I bet you feel it. Don't feel bad about it. But what we're trying to get you to is you're probably emotionally starting here. There's a lot of benefit if you can get yourself, you know, to hear. And like an example I thought of was Yossi was trying to, trying to deliver criticism to someone and and that person was taking it real personally and emotionally and kind of zoning out. And and so Yossi said, just assume that we already like you and think you're doing a good job. This is just to get you better. <laughs> exactly. Which just like flustered the person more. It, 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 they didn't know how to process it. And I was thinking, but gosh, like this isn't we're deciding if you're getting into heaven or not. It's, you know, maybe you didn't see this angle on this thing and now it's clear to us, but I decided when I took my, my, my last command that I was going to take every opportunity to explain the why. Um, and in doing so, expose myself, if necessary, or my staff to criticism uh, if, if we weren't able to convey that uh, to, to every unit, every soldier that we went and visited with. And, and what I told the, the squadron, uh, which is an organization of, of anywhere from about five to 600, what I told them is, is that uh, I will do this so long as the, the opportunity presents itself. Understand that the army, I'm under no obligation as your commander to explain why. Um, I'm, I'm choosing to explain why uh, when the opportunity presents itself. So long as you understand that if I say, take the hill and take it now and don't call me until you've taken it, you're going to move out without question. So I got lots of yes sirs and, and roger sirs. And, and on only one or two occasions do I think it ever had to come down to that. But before then, I invested in going to every unit particularly when missions were either very complicated or hard for the soldier to understand, uh, very demanding, more so than usual, um, you know, put them in a position where they weren't going to be able to go home or spend time in, you know, with, with their families or so forth, or it was very inherently risky and, and the loss of life was high. Uh, we would go and, and explain the why and open ourselves up to questions um, from, from the organizations to make sure that we were conveying that responsibly. Um, and, and I think that that paid huge dividends because I think when it came to those occasions where, um, we, we had to ask them to do something without explanation, they knew that our, we were probably act, acting in the best interest of the organization of the mission and of those soldiers. And furthermore, as you guys know, probably way better than us, um, when everybody's on board, 
everything is much more smooth, right? So if everybody knows why they're staying up late, why they're working hard, why they're doing whatever it is we're asking of them as leaders, um, that buy-in just just pays off as, as better better morale, better productivity, um, you know, increased sense of purpose, all that good stuff. And so it, it turned out being really worth our efforts uh, to convey the why, uh, even if it meant that sometimes they came back and said, sir, we appreciate you sharing that, but it still doesn't make any sense to us. Do- do you, do you guys ever get like the other thing I was thinking and, and thank you, Brian, for opening the floodgates, <laughs> but just, uh, I would fear if I said, let me try to do the, the red selling of things that someone who wasn't trained in what it was for would just use it as an opportunity to kind of complain would, you know, it would be like, oh, well, it's cause you, you know, never liked me or something like that. I was like, well, that's not helpful. <laughs> Well, well, so that, that that's why during like the AAR process, so our job as OCs, we, we, we kind of moderate it. Now, when you're red teaming like, and it's a commander, you know, you're not necessarily, you're not going to have an OC there to red team it. But, you know, that's where like the, so the role of the sergeant major or somebody like a trusted agent is there to kind of help moderate things. Like here, here's, here's what we saw as the OCs and here's where the disconnect was. And so, you know, there's different levels, different, different ways, different methodologies. But again, it requires. I go back to the emotional intelligence piece. I go back to, you know, folks that have been given some sort of instruction or understanding on, on how to deal uh, with, with their emotions uh, in a professional manner uh, and understanding, you know, that not everything is personal and not everything is directed towards you or not everything is about you. Do, do you guys think that you were team oriented people before you joined the military or did your military training experience make you team goal oriented people i i mean i i grew up an only child so but the so the no. difference being <laughs> so right so it was it was all about some some steve lubert um but what i what i do what i do remember more than anything else uh is is watching my dad lead you know my dad was an, an air force officer he went on to be a general you know, I watched him go through his various levels of command as as we grew up as a family, and uh, but I spent so much time watching him and watching the way people responded to him, and I watched him make mistakes in leadership uh, that I probably even as a young adult knew right then. Yeah, he could have probably you know worded that better, uh, but I also saw the things that he did right that created teams and 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 led to to, to followership and made people want to achieve things uh, because it was important to him. Uh, and so I think I probably went into the military uh, having having watched military teams and organizations, you know, be successful, and having watched my dad be a leader. And I'm sure that influenced uh, influenced me as a as a young leader. And I sh- I probably built upon that as I progressed through the ranks. I, I would say is just coming into the army as a logistician. You know, you're not the tight. You know, you're not the tip of the spear. Uh, and so you know, our success completely is dependent upon how well we support other people. There's very few opportunities for it to be about you. Uh, and again, it, my, my job, my focus is I, I got to make sure Steven has everything he needs. I have to make Steven the best Steven he can be, you know. So the, the, the team concept is kind of ingrained in, in what we do in our field. If, if people come in and they don't have that, that ingrained in them early on, they will not be successful in the Army as a logistician. Yeah, my parents were both youngest children in their in their families i think my dad was youngest of three my mom was the youngest of three which is the the best combination for a successful loving marriage right because they have they are used to serving their older siblings and then it just translates into you know i think they've been married for like 40 plus years now um but so it was definitely modeled for me i think i got exposed to some of it through team sports and through scouting I don't think it was really solidified my own personality until the military, though. I, I think um, that was where, you know, I got to live it out more day to day than and it was sort of ingrained in me and taught to me in a way that, that taught to me through example from others, really, through leaders that I work. I've had an amazing uh, string of fantastic leaders throughout my military career. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I, people talk about toxic leaders. And I have no doubt that they have crossed paths and, and been victims of that, you know, so to speak, throughout their careers. But that has not been my case. I've had amazing leaders throughout my military career that have just, uh, I've learned so much from um, and, and hopefully, and tried to 
frankly emulate and and copy <laughs> you know yeah and, and when you say it and thinking about the the other side of the empathetic leadership thing i was thinking too outside of academia but you know other places i've worked yeah, the, the weight of a, a kind gesture and a listening ear from someone a couple rungs above you is huge, you know, and, and, and I think maybe the, sometimes the people do it because they know it has that effect, but sometimes, you know, they don't even realize the effect that when someone several rungs above you and spends a little time on your problems, it has to morale and to commitment and, and to all that. Yeah, I think too, when that, when leaders take a gamble on you or meet you where you're at in a moment of crisis in your life. Like you will, you will take a bullet for them <laughs> from that moment on. You will do whatever it takes to, uh, to serve that organization and that person. I mean, and they, that's not, you know, sometimes that's, they've, they've let you go for a, um, meaning they've, you know, allowed you to go take some personal leave to take care of some things, or, you know, maybe you're, you had a, a parent that was sick or whatever, you know, and they, they've taken a hit and the other, the rest of the organization has had to pick up the slack in your absence. But, you know, when you come back from that, um, what I found is, is that the leaders have been sympathetic or empathetic in that moment, man, I, I will, I will go, I will do whatever it takes to, to, to make them successful. Guarantee you, we could all rattle off three to five folks that if we got a phone call at two o'clock in the morning that said, be here at this time, don't ask questions, we'd all jump. Um, because of, because of scenarios like that. And it, and it's, it's, it's not, it's not overly complex and it's not hard. It's just people being good people. I, I think I, one of the best examples or one of the best advice I got was, um, from one of my SAMS instructors. It was, um, he told us, you know, someday the army's going to tap us on the shoulder and we're going to be done with this, right. Or the army's going to be done with us probably maybe before we were done with the army, right. We're ready to be done with the army. And that happens in corporate environments all the time too. I imagine, you know, at that moment, what's going to be your legacy? You know, I mean, we're all going to move on from whatever endeavor we're currently in. And when people look at, at you know, think about you or look, you know, you look back at your legacy uh, in, in your last days, what's it going to be? Is it going to be one that was just like driving everyone and driving everyone out, or is it going to be one that was uh, building people up and and making others successful? Gosh, thank you so much, guys, for your time, for the stories, the personal stories, too, that you've shared with us in your insights. Thank you for your service to our country historically and going forward. And, and thank you for your conversation today. I know I think it's going to make me a better leader just for being able to listen to it and probably everyone else who listens to the podcast, too. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks, Dave. We really appreciate it. And, uh, and we've enjoyed uh, every moment uh, with you, your team, and, and the other students uh, and graduates at, at MIT and CTL. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of MIT Supply Chain Frontiers. My name is Arthur Grau, Communications Officer for the Center, and I invite you to visit us anytime at ctl.mit.edu or search for MIT Supply Chain Frontiers on your favorite listening platform. Until next time.